This evening, I thought as we continue this theme, I would read for you the remainder of Proverbs chapter 4. That would be verses 10 through 27. And again, throughout this chapter, Solomon is exhorting us not only to learn what it is that we need to learn in order to know what to do, but that we would actually uh, do that. And of course, we're going to uh, be reminded that's precisely what our Lord Jesus Christ did as our example. Uh, Solomon writes, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Hear, my son, and accept my sayings, and the years of your life will be many. I have directed you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in the upright paths. When you walk, your steps will not be impeded, and if you run, you will not stumble. Take hold of instruction and do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked and do not proceed in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Do not pass by it. Turn away from it and pass on. For they cannot sleep unless they do evil and they are robbed of sleep unless they make someone stumble. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn. It shines brighter and brighter until the full day. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their body. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put devious speech far from you. Let your eyes look directly ahead and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. Watch the path of your feet and all your ways will be established. Do not turn to the right nor to the left. Turn your foot from evil. May the Lord bless again His word to our hearing. You know, those last couple of verses do remind us a bit of uh, Pilgrim's Progress. As you know, the whole book is framed around God's truth and the importance of living the life that He calls us to live and not stepping either to the left or to the right, not even the slightest, from what He calls us to do. That is the safe path. That is the path our Lord Jesus Christ walked. That is the path that He would have us to walk. Now again, why should we do this? Well, because of its importance to what it is that we as Christians ought to be about more than anything else, and that is that we might have a heart for God, that we might be the kind of people that actually catch the Lord's eye as He looks throughout the world, uh, looking for those that He can support, looking for those that He can use, because it's only those who have a heart for Him that He can use. Now, again, we've seen, not surprisingly, that to be such people, it's important for us to have a heart for certain things and not for other things, uh, that we love God first and foremost, because if we don't love the Lord, quite frankly, we're not going to be willing to do anything He calls us to do. We're not going to be willing to pay the price that we must be willing to pay in order to serve Him. Yes, there is a cost that is involved. It will cost us our lives. We have to love Him more than our lives. We've seen that we have to love our neighbors as ourselves because if we don't care about our neighbor, we're not going to do what we need to to reach out to them with the gospel, which is primarily what the Lord calls us to do. How can we be useful to Him if we're not willing to do what He tells us to do? Of course, we've seen it's important that we don't love the world, that we don't seek its glory but love God and seek the glory that comes from Him, that we don't conform to this world but stand out from this world and stand apart from the world so that we can point the way to God. This morning we saw that in order to do these things, we have to know how to do them. We need to follow Jesus' example as He followed really the commandment of His Father given through Solomon in our text to acquire wisdom that He would know what it is that He had to do. 
Jesus listened to his parents as they instructed him. Jesus listened to his teachers as uh, he and his family worshipped at the synagogue, and he took to heart what they had to say. He learned those things. He remembered those things. He did those things. And yes, we understand that Jesus had certain advantages that we don't have. Jesus did have a perfect mind. He did have a perfect heart that wasn't affected by the fall so that he could comprehend these things as perfectly as any man ever could. Actually, we might say like Adam before the fall. And he had a perfect heart to desire to learn these things and to remember them. Now, we can't think perfectly, and very often we don't want to learn, quite frankly, or remember what the Lord has told us, but God has, has uh, overcome that problem for us by giving us His Spirit. The fall might have affected our minds, but it hasn't destroyed our ability to use them for God's glory. We may not be geniuses like our Lord Jesus Christ undoubtedly was, but we can learn. And our hearts may not be perfect as the Lord's heart was perfect. The sin that's inside our hearts is going to be resisting us as we seek to learn God's will. But the Spirit will help us overcome that resistance because He wants us to learn. He wants us to learn for the same reason Jesus learned, so that He might do what His Father sent Him into the world to do. The Spirit of God wants us to learn God's truth so that we might do what He has made us to do and called us to do as well. Now, this evening, let's consider that our Lord Jesus Christ not only knew God's truth, but He lived according to it. And let's remember that when Jesus Christ did this, He did this not only that He might save us, but He also did it as an example for us to follow. It is interesting, as I mentioned before, the, the, just how widespread in the church it is today. And actually, those churches do seem to flourish because they preach a message that is more popular than the message of self-denial and obedience. Uh, basically, they're teaching the idea of just, you know, easy believism. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. You don't have to repent. You don't have to obey. You're safe and sound. You can still have the world and have heaven too. A very popular message, but a very wrong message. And it shouldn't surprise us that Satan would be working overtime to try to get believers to believe this and to short-circuit everything that the Lord actually intends in the plan of salvation. We do need to remember that his plan is not just that He would save us, and His plan isn't just that we would learn what God would have us to do but not do it, but rather it is His plan that we become like Jesus Christ, that we actually follow His example. And His example is that of one who was fully committed to the Lord and who did His will regardless of the cost to Himself personally. So if we are to have the kind of heart that's going to catch God's eye as He looks down at the world, we need to set our hearts to live according to His truth. So let's consider first that Jesus lived according to God's truth. We need to remember that learning the truth is not an end in itself. It is really a means to an end. It's not enough to learn what it is that God wants us to do we must also do it if we're, of course, to benefit from that truth ourselves or if we're going to do what it is that God wants us to do and benefit anyone else. Now, that is what true wisdom is. We do need to realize that when Solomon says acquire wisdom, he doesn't mean just stock your head full of knowledge. You're not going to be blessed just because you know what's right. You're only going to be blessed if you do what is right. And to the Jewish mind, they really didn't even have to be told this because this is the way they were geared. This is the way they were instructed. This is the way they thought. Uh, to learn something, to know the right thing to do and not to do it, is really the height of foolishness. They learned so that they might do. They had a very pragmatic or practical mind. Maybe not pragmatic in the sense we often think about it do this because it works out well for me, but they had a practical mind. They learned that they might do. 
Now, sadly, we are often content merely to know what we are to believe rather than believing it as we should or knowing what it is that we are to do without actually doing it. You've already heard earlier this evening that we're particularly prone to do that in the Reformed camp. There is so much to learn, so much to know, and, and it's exciting to learn those things, isn't it? To understand how it all works together, to understand what God has revealed, especially as it has to do with our salvation. And to learn those things can be quite exciting, but if we're just learning it to learn, you'll find that when you reach the end of everything there is to learn, then our Christianity drops off because the excitement has left, because we've just been doing it only to stimulate our minds and not really to serve the Lord. We're not simply studying just to learn. We are studying to do. We need to understand that this is not what Jesus was like. He didn't study just to know how He might please His Father. He actually did what was pleasing to Him. And of course, we, knew, well, we know that He did that at least for two different reasons. He, he did it to save us, and we don't want to minimize that. But He also did it to give us an example. Now, we know again the importance that Jesus actually do what He knew was the right thing to do in order to save us because we didn't do it. We didn't do what the Lord commanded. We failed in absolutely every way. We failed in Adam. If Adam had only obeyed the Lord, then we would be living in paradise. We would be doing God's work. We'd be building His kingdom. Everyone in the world would be, and we would not have the problems we had. But sadly, Adam failed. He failed to obey. We failed in him. And from the time we came into this world, we have failed every single day to live up to what the Lord has called us to do. Even after trusting in Jesus Christ, we still fail. And left to ourselves, we would have been condemned. But again, Jesus came and He did obey perfectly. He obeyed for us and He died on the cross for us in order that we might be set free from the curse of our failure and that we might be given a perfect righteousness to enter in to heaven. And again, this morning we saw as we're learning, that's the most important thing we can possibly learn. We need to learn the gospel first and we need to receive what it is that Jesus Christ has done for us as He offers Himself to us in the gospel because He is the only way to escape the penalty of hell and the only way to arrive in heaven. So it is important that Jesus obeyed for that purpose. But again, for our purposes this evening, that is not the only reason why He obeyed. He also obeyed to set a pattern for us, to set a pattern for His people, to be an example to us of how we ought to live. As we read the Bible, we need to observe that example. We need to see what Jesus was like. We need to get to, to know Jesus. And as we follow Him, we need to apply what He did, His mind. We need to think His thoughts, His desires. We need to seek to have those desires, His actions, His words. We need to follow Him. Now, again, we've already been considering uh, how it is that Jesus loved His Father, how it is that He followed Him. And again, let me just say by way of um, a brief summary that Jesus Christ loved His Father, loved Him supremely, desired to do His will. It was more important to Him even than His, uh, his food and drink. Again, I am always impressed by that passage where Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman and after she leaves, the disciples come and they bring him food and water and he says, I have food to eat, I have water to drink that you don't know of. And they, they thought, did somebody bring him something to eat and drink while we were looking for food? And he said, my food is to do the will of my Father, to accomplish his purpose. That is what Jesus was all about. That was more important to him than anything else that he might do his Father's will. His life was an act of continual devotion to his Father. And certainly, if we look at the life of Jesus Christ, one of the things that strikes us, or one thing that strikes us more than just about anything else, is His love for others and His desire to minister to the needs of those around Him. 
Jesus healed the sick. Jesus raised the dead. He fed the poor. He especially preached the gospel. You know, our Lord Jesus Christ, when He was in this world ministering, ministered not just to the people who were here in the world at the time He was here, but He ministered to us as well through His life and through His death that He might give us life. Jesus, above everyone else, has loved His neighbor as He has loved Himself. And of course, in order to do this, He did have to keep Himself separate from the world. He did not love the world or the things in the world. He did not allow Himself to be conformed to the world, nor did He seek the world's glory every time He had the opportunity to gain something of it. He rejected it in order that He might seek the glory that comes from the Father. Jesus was doing what it is He wants us to do. He was setting a pattern and an example for us. He was doing, again, what Solomon exhorted us to do this morning and this evening. Again, let me just draw a couple of verses out of our text. Take hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not proceed in the way of evil men. Let your eyes look directly ahead, and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. Watch the path of your feet, and all your ways will be established. Do not turn to the right nor to the left. Turn your foot from evil. That's exactly what our Lord Jesus Christ did in His love for the Father and His love for others and His seeking glory from the Father and not from the world. He walked on the path of righteousness, neither turning to the left nor to the right, until He arrived in heaven, that place of greatest exaltation. And again, He did this as our example, author to the Hebrews tells us, fix your eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ and run that race. Fight through everything you have to, run in such a way that you may win. Follow the Lord Jesus Christ, follow His example. And again, let's remember that his example was one of devotion to his father and also love to his neighbor. Jesus lived this life not only for himself, but he also did everything he could to help others by teaching them to walk according to his father's will as well. Just consider again what Jesus preached in his life. Now again, Jesus did this both to save us and He did this as an example for us to follow. This is the kind of life that honors the Father. And if we're going to catch the Father's attention, that He might use us and strongly support us in the things that we attempt to do for His glory, we need to seek to live this kind of life as well. We need to go beyond simply knowing God's will to actually doing His will, which includes, of course, helping others to do it. Now, we've already seen what it is this, this means. We need to do what the Lord commands us to do, and we need to stay away from what He forbids. Another way of putting this is that we need to love as the Lord commands us to love, because that's really the summary of everything that Jesus did, was purely love. It's the summary of all the commandments that He lived according to is that he might love his father and love his neighbor as himself. Or still another way of looking at it is we must seek to be holy as Jesus was holy and stay away from everything that is unholy. Now, I think that this much is clear, but what I'd like to just focus on is, again, the heart. You know, we, we talk about uh, the, the, the content of what it is we need to do. But we do know that if we don't do it in a way that is honoring to the Lord, if we do it against our will, if we do it grudgingly, if we, as it were, have a will against a will in this, it's not going to be pleasing to Him than if we offer to Him our whole heart. So I want to focus on our remaining time, what kind of heart the Lord wants to see in us as we actually set out to do these things. I think we all understand there are differing degrees of submission, submission to commandments and resistance to sin. 
of, of wanting to do what the Father wants us to do and of not wanting to do what it is He actually forbids us to do. Now, of course, the example that Jesus gave to us is a perfect example. Jesus perfectly submitted to His Father. He did it with His whole heart. And He perfectly resisted temptation. He perfectly resisted sin with the same whole heart. His heart was absolutely resolute. His heart was absolutely holy. Now, again, that is the example that we are actually called to follow. That is the standard that we are to seek to live up to. That is what the Lord desires of us. Now, which one of us, of course, can say that we have actually lived up to that standard? Well, we haven't. This isn't what we find in our hearts. We struggle with submission. There are certain things the Lord commands us to do that oftentimes we, we find ourselves not wanting to do. And we also struggle sometimes resisting temptation and sin, and we often fail. We, we struggle to love God with a whole heart the way that our Lord Jesus Christ did, or to love others to the point where we reach out to them with the gospel. Now, we often find ourselves loving the world and wanting to conform to the world, wanting its glory rather than conforming to God's truth and seeking His glory. Sometimes we find it's much easier to read a novel or maybe to watch a movie than to read and study God's Word that we might learn His truth. All too often when we have read it or when we've heard a sermon, we forget what we've heard as soon as it's over. Our minds shift to other things. Our attention is no longer arrested, and now we lose what we have gained. Basically, in, in short, we have sin that we have to contend with in our hearts. This is something Jesus didn't have. He actually didn't have to struggle, but we do have to struggle. And what this means is that our duty actually includes something that Jesus didn't have to do. We have to fight against the sin in our hearts, whereas He did not have to fight against sin in His heart because He had no sin, which is why the command comes to us through the Apostle Paul. And again, these are very sobering words that tell us that we must fight against, we must resist the flesh that is in our hearts, that desire uh, to resist what the Lord would have us to do. It's what keeps us from having a whole heart. We have to put that sin to death. Paul writes, So then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. By the way, this is sort of the conclusion of the argument that Paul brings up in Romans chapter 8. And he tells us that though we were captive to our flesh, we've been set free by the Spirit of God. If the Spirit of God lives in us, then He will work within us the grace we need to follow the Lord. He will help us to do what it is Paul is commanding us to do here. And so he says, examine yourself. And see if you have the Spirit of God in you, if you have this desire to overcome the flesh and to put it to death, or whether you're simply just giving into the flesh and living according to the flesh and doing what the flesh wants. If you do that, you don't have the Spirit, and you will end up in hell, basically is what he's saying. We need to do this. At the very least, if we are believers and we're not setting all of our, uh, well, giving our best effort at putting our sins to death, at the very least, it's going to cripple us and make us the kind of person that the Father is going to overlook as He looks through the world looking for someone who is willing to do His will, someone He can support. He's not going to use us. And of course, at the very worst, if we're not fighting our sins... If we're not trying to do what the Lord commands us to do, if we're not trying to fight against what He forbids us to do, then we're not believers at all and still in danger of God's judgment. Paul says, if you don't put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will die unless you turn from your sins 
and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not a game. This is God's Word, and it has to be true of us. We must put our sins to death. We must resist that which is fighting against us, and we must make progress in the gospel. If by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. We need to go beyond knowing. We need to do what the Lord calls us to do, and in order to do that, we have to fight against our flesh that is resisting us. Now, finally, if we don't kill our sins so that we can follow Christ's example, then how are we ever going to be useful to God in ministering to others? Remember that Jesus not only lived for the Father's glory, but He did it by seeking to help others do the same, by ministering to them, by preaching the gospel to them. And that is exactly what the Lord calls us to do for Him. He says, our Lord tells us in the Great Commission, and this has to do with all of us at differing levels, depending upon where the Lord has called us and what He's given us to do. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In other words, Jesus was giving to his church the very same task that he was about while he was on this earth. And how can we do this? How can we do what our Lord calls us to do unless we set our hearts to learn his truth and purpose to do it? How can we do this unless we're willing to put our sins to death and live a holy life. Well, we can't. We have to do what the Lord calls us to do. We have to acquire wisdom, and in the acquiring of that wisdom, we need to understand the true wisdom is not just knowing God's will, but doing God's will. And of course, in order to do God's will, we must put our sins to death. And in order to put our sins to death, we do have to commit ourselves to use the means God has given us to put those sins to death, again, the means of grace. Spend time in the Word, spend time in prayer. Do not lose the truth that the Lord is entrusting to you. Buy it up and do not sell it. Uh, don't forget what it is the Lord shows you from Lord's Day to Lord's Day. Remember those things, apply those things, uh, set your heart to destroy those things that get in your way from applying them. Seek the Lord and seek to be useful to Him. And as you do, you will grow into the kind of person that the Lord will be able to use. And that is really our heart's desire as Christians. And that is our goal as believers. That is what it means to follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. So may the Lord give us the grace to follow that example. Let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask that the Lord might help us to do this.